Uh, hey everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the short five game main slate that we have here on Thursday, uh, June 8. Um, we are not going to be able to get anything out for, uh, you know, video wise, for uh, the early slate just starts too early and we've got some uh, shenanigans going on with projection models all across the industry due to the couple of um, postponements from the last couple of days, uh, notably yesterday, from the um, you know, game in New York here. So, working out some of those issues and won't be able to get a video out for the five game early. Uh, that said, we do have projections and ownership loaded to the site for uh, for the early for premium subs so uh, head over to the projections page or if you've got the saber sim package as well they should be populated there so we're just going to go over the five game main and i i thought this would be a, a decent opportunity to go over some um some initial sort of game theory and construction thoughts now we've got I mean, first of all it's a spencer strider day right and our initial look here is that I mean he is <laughs> he's projecting a full seven points higher than any other starter on the day, and it's not like we've got a bunch of trash cans uh, going on the mound here, right? You got Framber and you have Verlander, notably. I mean Jose Barros has not been overly horrific this season, right? Drew Smiley's been serviceable uh, through several of his outings. Uh, Reed Detmers has popped once or twice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, it's not like we've got a, a bunch of super attackable arms here. Uh, it, granted, they are in some bad matchups, right? Framber does get Toronto. Uh, Jose Barrios does get Houston, right? Verlander with Atlanta. Um, and on the on down the road, Drew Smiley getting the Angels is. You know, not the best matchup uh, for a a left-hander necessarily. They are pretty right-handed heavy. They got some some righties that can that hit lefties pretty well. Um, and historically, he's given up some power to left-handers also. And you know, Shohei Otani is uh, no slouch. So um, some difficult matchups for sure, but even still. We would mostly expect on on most slates, right? If we were to run all of these matchups, simulate all of these matchups, um, we'd probably expect these projections for these guys to come in in roughly the same range, right? And then you've got Strider up here, who also has a a difficult right strikeout matchup. It's a high contact team over here in the Mets. He's still projecting from a median basis, seven full points higher. I mean, that is an out of, like, that. it's outrageous, um, the delta here. So what that, I think, offers us is, um, you know, an opportunity to think about opportunity cost, right? You know, we have just a five-game main slate here, and we get into this short and really interesting range with very few games um, that the opportunity cost really starts to uh, play a pretty big role. Now, generally, um, you know, there there's opportunity cost with pitchers, right? But on a 10 or 12 game main slate, we don't really care about that for the most part. Um, it's usually more equitable in baseball or other very high variance sports hockey, for example, to be fading super popular players to capitalize on the variance, right? And thus the opportunity cost that you uh, sort of expose yourself to when you fade a whatever, a 35 or 40% own starting pitcher is mitigated a little bit assuming that your other plays are strong and solid as well, right? So, uh, however, when we get into these shorter slates, opportunity cost and ownership becomes far more important to heed, right? 
Um, and with the projection aggregates and mostly the, the ownership aggregates on these shorter and kind of middling slates here, this is where they really shine. Um, we get to see where the entire industry is and we have the most accurate projection um, for large field tournament ownership. And using this and really getting granular with it and thinking about the opportunity cost of absorbing 60% or 30% or, or whatever percent on a starting pitcher is very valuable. Because in this particular case, um, given that this projection delta with Spencer Strider, 60% uh, ownership is too low, right? Given this projection delta, if this is a median outcome, then there is zero reason that Spencer Strider should not be 100% owned here, right? Um, there, There isn't a single lineup you should build that does not have him in it, even at this kind of exorbitant price tag of 12,000. But I mean, it's still a five game slate. We still have cheap hitters, right? That we can squeeze guys in with, right? So what happens here if we just decide to take a shot and, and fade this median projection is, well, great. Yeah, we're, we're fading 60, 75%. Like in higher stakes, he'll be 80% owned and he should be. Um, lower stuff, it'll probably be a little bit lower, but he's going to be well north of 60. This is, once again, a very early figure, uh, and this will climb. So, great. If we fade Strider, then, sure, we, we fade 60% ownership, and in the off chance that he only puts up 18 points, or, you know, in, in the really rare occurrences he gets totally blown apart and he ends with six or he gets hurt or you know something totally crazy and and off the board um great we faded 70 percent ownership or, or whatever it is and now we've got a leg up on 70 percent of the field right but that still means that we have to get there with the other guys that we play right and that's where we kind of have to get granular and figure out where the the other best plays are, right? However, what happens if this median projection, if, what happens if Strider still pops for 20, 20 points or something, right? He underperforms his median projection, but that's still very much within range because this median projection is a simulation of thousands and thousands of outcomes right so what happens when he pops for 20 right which is with a median projection of 23 that's very much within range right within a couple standard deviations the this is where the opportunity cost really uh, plays a very large role because at 20 points, he's going to be so popular that at 20, 20 points for a starting pitcher when every other starting pitcher from a median outcome basis is projecting still four points lower than that, four and five and even higher, 20 points is still very much serviceable, right? So, great, he underperformed his median projection but he's 70% owned, and he still put up something serviceable. I mean, 18 points on a five-game slate from starting pitcher is serviceable sometimes if we're only targeting, whatever, 130, 140, 150 points on DK, right? Is that going to win us a tournament? Uh, probably pretty unlikely, unless those are the top scorers. And even at 18 points, what happens if every other one of these guys also underperforms their median projection, right? That's pretty unlikely, of course, for every one of them to underperform. Uh, but it's still possible. And when we take the risk of fading a guy that is 70% owned with 
a median projection so high, he doesn't have to actually hit this. He doesn't have to hit his 50-point ceiling, right? Because he's still far and away from a median projected standpoint, the best play. So what I think we've got here is a very interesting dynamic of deciding, I think deciding to, you know, whether to play Strider or not is not really the question, right? The the median delta here suggests that uh, it it's so far in a way a stone lock that you've got to make other decisions, right? You basically just have to click the lock button because his underperformance is still, uh, from a, a distribution standpoint, is still going to take up a very large chunk of the overperformance distributions from a lot of these other guys, right? Strider could still put up 18 points, and if you click on a Drew Smiley, for example, I mean, Drew Smiley still got to overperform his median projection of 12 points by 50%, right? And that is getting a little bit difficult, right? If you click down and, and you know try to get cute, save 8,000 to distribute to your hitters to get to a Randy Vasquez... Right? He's got to overperform his projection by 115-120%. And that's quite outsized because, once again, this is a median figure. And we've simulated these numbers thousands and thousands of times. And, yeah, there are certain outcomes where each one of these guys pops and outperforms Strider, of course. But it's just so much more likely that even in a down or disappointing outing for Strider that he outperforms all of these guys still in most of their outcomes that fading a very popular arm here on a short slate is incredibly dangerous because you know, sure can if you're building a bunch of teams uh go ahead and and fade a couple striders cuz yeah it will make you different, and even if he puts up 25, if two of these other guys that you land on, say a Verlander and a Framber, for example, hit their ceilings, we know that they can pop for 30 at any, in, in any given outing, of course, right? If they both pop for, say, the same score as Spencer Strider, well, you just saved, what, 1,600 if you get to Framber, and then, uh, what is this, 3,400, getting to Verlander, and you can distribute that 5000 to hitters, right? That's $1,000 per hitter, and that could be, that could serve to, um, it'll be pretty equitable for you, right? So it's definitely possible, right, and very much within range, but given how big this delta is, um, in a lot of scenarios, and by a lot, I mean very close to all, it's too dangerous, and you sacrifice a lot of your win equity, because at 20 points or whatever, there are so many distributions of other, like SP2s, and hitters that can serve could serve up a you know 180 point score or whatever on a five game slate that could be a winning number fading a 20 point you know it's very high probability 20 point outing is incredibly dangerous and super risky right so um that's kind of a, a long rant, but these are the things we've got to think about, and it's another reason why we have to do some really granular fundamental analysis here with all of these games, but mostly when we're building teams, we have to factor in the dynamic that the 
industry aggregate projections are really showing us, right, uh, that are telling us. And at the moment, this projection is so far and away higher than everybody else that this ownership figure at the moment is way too low. So that should, hopefully, I mean, hopefully it comes in at sub 60% in a lot of your tournaments. And then if you've got 80% Strider or 95% Strider or whatever, you're getting a bunch of leverage on the team, uh, on the field when you really shouldn't be, right? Because he's projecting 50% higher than everybody else on the, on the day. So I think that offers us an opportunity, at least at the moment, to analyze the ownership figure here and try and exploit this to the upside, right? Normally, when we see a super high ownership figure, we just, like, instantly balk and be like, yo, whoa, we got to go the other way. We don't want to do this, right? I can just get different. It's fine. Because in, in baseball and in high-variance sports and in DFS in general, variance suggests that uh, landing on very popular plays isn't always the best strategy, certainly in tournaments. But that's not always the case, right? And in cases like this, where we've got one guy from a median standpoint that projects so far and away better than everybody else. It's not like we just simulated Strider 15 times and all these other guys 500 times or something like that, right? He was simulated just as many times in creating these median projections as everybody else. And it still popped out this monster figure. So that suggests to us that we can go the other direction, play it the other way, and try and exploit what is perhaps a, a low figure or an undervalued figure relative to what the actual performance metric is telling us, right? So that said, um, I mean, I think you guys kind of know where I stand. Like Spencer Strider here, even in a down strike up, strikeout matchup, is a stone lock, I think, uh, given these projection deltas so far. Now, if Framber comes up, like, who knows? Three guys from Toronto could get stretched tonight uh, for whatever reason. Um, and and Framber could pop to a, a 19 or a 20-point 20 per, 20 median projection by the end of the day. And the ownership value may not change all that much. In which case, you know, that opportunity cost gap that we're seeing right now in the numbers, that shrinks quite a bit. Right? But at the moment, it is so large, it's a giant chasm here. And basically, we need to see how we can capitalize on that, right? So just get into the games here real quick. We'll try and keep it more condensed because that's a 20-minute rant or whatever um, on opportunity cost. But once again, on very short slates, we have to keep this stuff in mind in very high-variance sports. So Framber at 10-4. Uh, first of all, he's, he's very much playable, right? Um, even at this median projection and this price tag, this is a five-game slate still, right? You can eat 10-4 on the mound with a slightly lower median projection than you would prefer. Right in a vacuum, this is fine to eat on a five-game slate, and of course the ownership here is fantastic. Right, it's going to be difficult to get both he and Strider in the same lineup and still feel okay with all of all of your hitters. Right, um, it's not typical that we have so much value where everybody is just free in the batter's box. You still got to make decisions a little bit, and that will keep Framber's ownership down. But Framber is still a top 15 starting pitcher in baseball, right? This ground ball to fly ball ratio, while way down this season compared to last year, is still elite and is still in the top 1% of starting pitchers. His strikeout stuff is still in the top 5% of starting pitchers, right? It's not to say that Framber doesn't have or isn't exhibiting some attackable sort of holes this season, right? This changeup has been dreadful. Historically, it's been a very, very equitable pitch for him. 
he's eking a little bit more value out of the slider than we've seen in his last several starts. So that's very encouraging. But the changeup has still been bad, right? And that makes him attackable. So that means we can we can do both um play both ends of the spectrum here right we can play for amber on the mound because well he's only 13 percent owned and any and in really in any given matchup framber has the type of arsenal that keeps him so far down in the strike zone and suppresses so much production right he's got a 20 era with a 270 exit that's a damn good number even though there is a delta between the two right 385 x era is kind of a noisy figure um but he still has enough in the tank to pick through any lineup in baseball on in any given start, right? So th- at this ownership figure and in a vacuum, we'd be like, okay, let's smash it. Doesn't matter who it is. It's five game slate, and he's 15% owned. He's top 15 starting pitcher in baseball. Let's do it. And I think that's a fine play, right? That's a fine approach. However, we can consider going to the other side as well because he's still attackable and more attackable this season than he has been in years past. And that's because his main out pitch against opposite-handed hitters, Toronto's going to be very right-handed heavy tonight, right? They got some pretty damn good right-handed hitters who hit lefties pretty well. His main out pitch is yielding extreme negative value to the field here. And he's lost he, He's lost p- this pitch completely. He has no idea what's going on with it. Right, he's right in the middle of the plate with it. Can't spot it at all. Can't keep it down in the strike zone. So it's naturally leading to a lot of hard contact here. Right, it's just a 90, 90 mile an hour change when his two seamer, right, his fifty percent fastball pitch, is at just ninety six. Right, you need a changeup to be at, at least seven mile an hours worth of velo delta. To be really all that equitable. Otherwise, just kind of a uh, a second fastball, right? That you're really not throwing nearly as hard as your main stuff, which effectively speeds up the bat of everybody in the batter's box. It makes it far easier to hit. So that's why we see a 40% hard contact rate over a pretty respectable sample here. We got half a season's worth of innings, 79 innings, and we got 68 and two-thirds. It's not like he's seeing a lot of lefties, right? Teams still stack right-handers against Framber because he throws a changeup and a slider at a curveball, right? These are okay pitches, the curveball mostly, and the two-seamer, definitely. These are okay pitches in the opposite end of a platoon to, to attack with, right, if you're in offense. Or you want to go after a two-seamer. You want to go after the curveball. They're far more hittable than an opposite-handed slider, or a changeup, right? Since a changeup is a pitch really designed to keep opposite-handed hitters off balance. So teams are still stacking a lot of righties. It's 68 and two-thirds at 270 hitters. This is not a small sample, right? He is still down in the strike zone, right, with the two-seamer curveball heavy, heavy breaking pitch usage here at a full 40% of the arsenal, right? Still down in the strike zone, so he's still generating the ground balls, which keeps him, excuse me, out of a lot of trouble. But that does not mean he's not vulnerable, right? He's still throwing a changeup 10% of the time in aggregate, and against right-handers, he's going to throw this pitch a lot more, right? So you'll see, um, you'll see more usage to opposite handed hitters than you will you know with a changeup, right? Than you will for same handed hitters. Unless it's a very, very good changeup, you guys really aren't gonna throw this to same handed hitters all that often. Right? So that makes it very interesting for us. Um and how we want to approach this. Now do we want to just sacrifice the the strider value, try and click in a 10-4 Fran Rivaldo's, because, as I mentioned, it's going to be very difficult to get two starting pitchers north of 10,000 on a five-game slate without getting very, very chalky. 
do we sacrifice Strider to to go play Framber when he's got a very attackable pitch against a super dangerous offense, right? Against left-handers this year, pretty average all the way around, right? They've underperformed quite significantly, right? But this is a big figure here, 17.5%. They're going to make a lot of contact still, right? Get the baseball on a line, 22% aggregate line drive rate. We got just 500 PAs, but 500 PAs is just 500 PAs, right? These numbers started to converge a little bit. Still hitting ground balls, which is not good if you're Toronto, right? And not making enough hard contact. The power number at a buck 21 is leaving a lot on the table. Can't really give in all the right-handed hitters that have historically hit left-handers very well. Can't really assume that through a full season sample that those numbers are, are to persist, right? So what we can do is look for a little bit of regression. We talk about regression for starting pitchers all the time. Well, we, we can see a lot of regression for aggregate offensive performance as well, right? So basically, long story short, I think both things are in play here. Uh, with Framber on the mound, yeah, you can get to him if you can make this happen because his ownership figure on a five-game slate is very, very attractive. Right, but the ownership figure doesn't totally account for um, opportunity cost, right? It and by totally account for, I mean it doesn't account for opportunity cost at all, right? That's a super difficult and um, kind of nuanced metric to build into projected ownership. So. I want to attack with that if we can make it happen, right? Like I said, this median projection here and the value score, it's not bad necessarily. We want guys north of 30 if we're paying this much for them, of course, but it's a five-game slate. We can do whatever the hell we want, right, and and capitalize on the variance. So this hard contact figure, I think, is attackable, right? Um, I think if we are looking for some regression from Toronto, in aggregate, just 29% as a team, but it's not like Bo Bichette, George Springer, and Vladdy Guerrero are not going to make more than 30% aggregate hard contact against a, an opposite-handed pitcher over very large samples, right? So I think we can get to a couple of Blue Jays here. I generally don't like stacking against Bramber, but we also have to keep in mind that a slightly lower median projection is an attackable figure, right? Well, if he's only projecting for this, then that means the other team is probably going to score against him. So we can attack that too. And how is that going to happen? Well, it's likely when he throws this change up to same-handed hitters, right? And it gets blasted. Gives up a lot of hard contact on that pitch, right? And despite very high ground ball rates, he's also got a sneaky high line drive rate here too, right? So it hasn't quite yet translated into power. It's because most of it's still on the ground. And he does still have whiff stuff, right? Still has the two-seamer, and a curveball that he gets whips with two opposite-handed hitters. But we can attack this because he's got one bad pitch that he's going to th still throw a lot, right? He's still going to throw it a lot. Um, so that said, you know, to get to the other side of the game, I suppose, we can also consider playing some Jose Barrios, right? He's also pretty unpopular, Kind of ignored by the field so far. He is, what is that, 1,600 cheaper than Framber Ball does. He's projecting within a point, and one point in median projection is effectively negligible. Not totally, because this is simulated a lot of times, right? But it's effectively negligible. So we can get to some Jose Barrios as well. Now, they did just get Jose Altuve back last night, right, at the top of the lineup. Um... And Chris Bassett really kind of tore them apart. Arsenal-wise, Jose Barrios has been pretty damn good and much better this season than in years past. He's still giving it up to opposite-handed hitters as well. For the same reason, he's got a bad changeup, right? Giving up a lot of outs to the field here. So this is an attackable pitch with left-handers. However, as we saw last night with Chris Bassett, he'd been far better against right-handers, even though he doesn't have the raw whiff stuff against right-handers, he still limits a lot of production against them. And Jose Barrios does the same thing, right, against very right-handed heavy lineups. And that's what Houston is going to be. They've only got two lefties, 
right, Jordan Alvarez. And it turns out that Jordan Alvarez was the one guy that got to Chris Bassett last night. Um, and Kyle Tucker, right? So this is a very playable and attackable spot at low ownership and a far more playable price tag than for Amber, you know, for Jose Barrios here, right? And a lot of his metrics are starting to correct to the upside, right? He's a little more balanced in his fastball usage. Still heavy slider, of course, but these have been very equitable pitches for him. Not that they haven't been for Framber or anything, but he is Berrios. Uh, lines up a little bit more favorably against the lineup that Houston is likely to roll out than Framber does necessarily against the lineup that Toronto is likely to roll out, right? Because Toronto's going to have probably seven righties in the lineup tonight, being able to attack a vulnerable two-seamer, right, to opposite-handed hitters and a vulnerable changeup, right? That's 60% of the arsenal. 60% of the time, they're going to see these two pitches or more, and that's an attackable spot for Toronto. On the other hand, Jose Barrios, he's going to be 60% of the time or more in the plus side of his platoon, where he doesn't have to use this changeup. Right, so that makes him a little bit more playable, uh, I think. Now that said, Houston may very well just kind of get off the schneid here and blast Jose Barrios, and he may be throwing his same-handed or a, an opposite-handed change. Um, you know, he may just be making mistakes to Jordan Alvarez, Kyle Tucker, and piping a two-seamer to Jose Altuve or something like that, and off she goes over the wall, hang a slider to a Corey Jolks or, or you know, whatever, and, you know, good game. That's certainly within range, right? But Barrios still has a pretty equitable arsenal here, right? 23% aggregate K rate, 7% walk rate. It's pretty damn good. And a buck fifty ground ball to fly ball. Very strong, right? Hard contact numbers are pretty excellent here. 25% to lefties, 28% to righties. Even though he's got this bad changeup, He's still down in the strike zone enough against lefties that the power that he does give up, it's not over-the-wall power. It's kind of like in a gap and down a line power, right? So that makes him very playable um, in this particular matchup because Houston's going to go so right-handed heavy, right? So I don't want to get too crazy here. Um, we've gotten through one game. We've gone at, whatever, a half hour already. But um, that said, 8800 I think this price tag's fine. I think the median projection is, as I discussed, fine, right? Value score, he's popping a little bit harder compared to Framber. And he's at similar ownership. So, for the most part, I think this is a pretty okay play, playing some, some Barrios here. I also think it's okay playing some Framber. And that said, neither of these guys, like both of these guys, let's start there, have a vulnerability. Uh, and that's in, it's at... That's in the changeup, right? They've got b good fastball stuff, good breaking stuff that they're going to be able to establish and get out of holes with. They don't walk people, right? They stay off of the barrel, and they got high ground ball rates, right? So overall, we can't really project, for the most part, a whole hell of a lot of production, right? Good suppression numbers from both of these guys, 2-0 ERA for Framber, 3.5 ERA for Barrios, Right? Buck 03 whip, buck 25 whip. So you're going to see like, what, two and a half hitters reach base per full inning here between these guys? I mean, that's not very encouraging for offense necessarily. So we kind of have to like pitching in that in that respect. But both of these guys on a five-game slate, they're attackable because they've got a vulnerable pitch, right? And if any one of the other pitches is not excellent, that makes them far more vulnerable, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think uh, everybody here is playable. I'd probably side with Toronto if I had to choose and attack Framber. Um, he's going to throw this change up a little more often to righties than, uh, than Barrios will have to throw to his ch change up to lefties tonight, right? I do like Framber, but he's more expensive, right? And that makes it harder to fit in more of the hitters that we would like to fit in. So if I had to choose, it'd be Toronto, then probably Berrios, then Framber, um, then the Astros. But, it, I mean, it's all pretty close here, and I think everybody's really in play. 
All right, so let's move on, try and keep the... Uh, we can get through Matt Dermody here um, and try and keep this a little bit condensed. He's 4,000. This is pretty good. Um, he, They're calling him up today. We don't have anything in the sheet. He's been in AAA all season, right? He is a starter. He is, he is stretched out, and there's upside for him at this price. Um, he's got a, a traditional kind of split here, more vulnerable to right-handers than he is to left-handers, of course, of course. Um, but we've got two guys down here at 4,000 today, right? You've got Matt Dermody and Randy Vasquez. Now, yesterday, Vasquez was actually garnering quite a bit of ownership before the game got canceled. And Dermody looks like he is going to garner a little bit as well. So the, the two guys down here at 4,000, we'll get to Vasquez in a minute, are basically splitting their ownership here. And, well, they're 4,000, and they're both starting pitchers, fully stretched out, in okay matchups, right? Vasquez getting the White Sox, and Dermody here getting Cleveland, who is bad, right? They're not going to strike out a lot, but they're most of their good hitters, or most of their best hitters, are hitting from the left side, right? They do have Ahmed Rosario, Josh Bell, who will switch hit, Gabby Arias, right? Uh, Mike Zanino, Miles Straw, but are we really scared of Mike Zanino and Miles Straw? I mean, with bad pitches, yeah, sure. Um, in the opposite end of a platoon, yeah, sure. But these guys still, um, even though they've historically hit left-handed pitching better than right-handed pitching, they still don't hit for a lot of power, right? So that means the creation metrics for really any of these guys we're not terribly worried about, right? 84 WRC plus against lefties so far and 665 PAs for Cleveland. Buck 24 ISO, 26% hard contact, a lot of ground balls, right? 19% strikeout rate, similar to Toronto here, right? But Toronto's going to create a lot more, and they got a lot better hitters in aggregate than does Cleveland, right? So I think you could play Cleveland. It's a five-game slate, right? You could look for some regression, as of right now, popping, what, uh, number two in value, but let's not get carried away. It's mostly because they're cheap, and they're getting a kind of a journeyman AAA arm here that's just making a spot start for them since Sale is, what, on the DL now. Uh, I believe this is his spot in the rotation. So um, we can get to some Cleveland for sure. Very hard, even on five-game slates, to get there with them with full stacks, um, they're, they're going to be pretty popular as well because they're cheap and they're getting a, you know, a triple-A arm. So with very low upside that they've displayed all season uh, against lefties, I think it makes Dermody a little bit more playable than it would Cleveland. However, there's very clearly more upside. If he doesn't have it going tonight and is just, you know, piping a bad change and not spotting a, a four-seamer... Then, you know, off she goes, and, and Cleveland can be off to the races because this is a plus matchup for them. Uh, but generally, do we want to be eating more ownership on a very low upside offense? Yeah, probably not. So could offer us some opportunity to get a little different uh, when we're constructing teams here, either by playing Dermody, right, or just by not playing as much Cleveland or getting a little bit different with them if we do. Right. Gabby Arias, for example, he's got dual eligibility at first and outfield. He's 2,300, right? He'll likely be in the six hole. Um, Med Rosario is back. He's at a cheap 3,700. That's playable. Like, you play Steve Kwan. It's not the plus side of his matchup here, but he's not going to strike out a lot. He's 4,000. He's leading off, right? Um, Josie Ramirez, yeah, you can play him. His power numbers are down, but he's still Jose Ramirez, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera. Can you play a Mike Zanino? Yeah, he's got all the power in the world if he can make contact. So it's very playable getting to Cleveland, um, but you know we have to contend with them being a pretty bad offense in general. So on the other side, Aaron Savali, uh, super bad matchup for him, of course. Um, he doesn't throw it past anybody, and that makes it really difficult to want to play him. Because if he gives up any production at all, it's insanely hard for him to make that up, right? And at 7,800, this is a fine median projection for somebody in this range, right? Roughly 1.8, 1 1.20 uh, point per dollar. It's fine. 
right? He's actually projecting in value score better than all of the three pitchers that we talked about so far, right? So that makes him, if from that metric alone, more playable, right? He's also coming in sub-15% right now. Now we got some ownership shenanigans that we got to flesh out yet um, throughout the day. So we'll see how this changes, but this makes him playable, these numbers on the surface, right? But this is a terrible fundamental matchup. Uh, he does have the cutter, which will keep him sort of on the board against opposite-handed hitters, right? This is a really good soft contact kind of roll-me-over pitch against cutters, or uh, against left-handers, opposite-handed hitters in this case, right? But he still throws a two-seamer, has the four-seamer that he gets back that value with, that he gives back on the two-seamer, right, which is fine. And he's got a really good curveball, right? So this makes him, this gives him a, a workable arsenal to, to navigate even a very difficult lineup over here in Boston. This is a plus matchup for their offense, right? And he is a below-average strikeout guy with an above average contact rate 82 and a half percent contact is a huge figure but Aaron Savali's not gonna beat himself he sequences well and he's got three pitches that he can really go to bat with throws a little bit of a change up also that he can neutralize opposite handed hitters with in addition to the pretty damn good cutter here surprising that his slider value is so bad given the plus value on the cutter but he doesn't throw it a lot, just doesn't really focus on this pitch, and it's more of the curveball, right? So, he sequences well, and he doesn't walk people. He throws strikes, stays off the barrel. Um, so, let's do it. I think this is very playable on a five-game slate. You can go after one of the better offensive teams here and play him. I think this is perfectly fine to mix into your pools. Just an average offense is Boston against right-handed pitching, despite the fact that they're pretty damn dangerous. They got some really good left-handed hitters. Verdugo doesn't strike out. Masataki Yoshida, Rafi Devers, of course. You've got the Jaron Duran, Tristan Casas, young bats that will strike out a lot, but have plenty of upside themselves. Manny Valdez also. Reese McGuire behind the plate. I mean, he's just kind of a, uh, well, he's standing from the left side of the batter's box. He's got a bat in his hand, right? So, Dangerous spot for Savali, of course, because he pitches to so much contact. So a plus up, plus spot for Boston, definitely, if you want to try and attack that. I think that's fine. Um, I'd probably have to decide with Savali, though. I think the... Even though I very rarely play him, I don't like going after uh, Boston with very high contact arms like Savali. But he has enough of an arsenal to navigate this team on a five-game slate. And we're going to have to get a little bit different and save some money if we are just going to click in Strider, right? So um, offensively, I'm not super thrilled about getting to this game. I do like Cleveland. Of course, I do like Boston. Um, but I think the pitching decisions that we make here, right, clicking in 4,000, well, you're saving a lot, you're getting different, is is pretty good, right? Getting off of Framber or even saving 1,000 to Jose Barrios, getting to Savali instead is pretty decent. And it's going to keep his ownership down for Savali because it's a bad matchup, right? So I think pretty much all sides there are once again playable. Uh, probably say that for a lot of games. Okay, let's move on. Um, Verlander here on the mound for the Mets. Now, Scherzer was very kind of enigmatic last night. Um, struck out 10, which is great. Sprayed 11 hits, which is not great. And gave up, what, five, five runs or something like that. Uh, Verlander still has that in the tank as well. And... Uh, I think that very much make that makes him very much playable, right? Um, now Verlander in his last several starts, right? He's still kind of getting into the swing of things here. Been up and down, um, has taken apart a, a good team and you know a low strikeout team in Toronto and Cleveland respectively. He got beat up at Coors Field. Which, yeah, whatever. I mean, he's a fly ball pitcher, and Coors Field can't really hold that against him necessarily. Uh, and he got beat up by Tampa, right? Um, he was fine against Cincinnati, really good, and got beat up a little bit by Detroit in his first outing back. So he's been up and down. It's really kind of been every other start for Verlander. Um, and this is a plus upside strikeout matchup for him. We saw, with the, we saw with Scherzer, a plus upside strikeout arm, did to them last night. And 
although this season the strikeout numbers for Verlander are quite down. Um, he did strike out eight against Toronto in his last outing. Just the two in Colorado, but got beat up there. Five and eight innings against Cleveland, but that's Cleveland. They don't strike out, right? And then just three and five innings against Tampa, who is Tampa, right? Struck out seven in seven innings against Cincinnati and five and five innings against Detroit, right? So the strikeout stuff, a little bit noisy here, but has displayed Verlander that it's still in the tank against a good lineup, right? And that he showed that in his last outing against Toronto, six innings, eight strikeouts, five hits, just gave up the one earned, did walk three batters, kind of uncharacteristic for Verlander, but it's still in there for him. So I think at this particular price tag, similar to where Scherzer was a couple starts ago in the mid eight Ks, this is a smash. Uh, I think he's a very good play here and he's coming in with a little bit higher ownership. Um, I would rather play him than Jose Barrios, I think. Uh, but I think both of these guys, I mean, they're at the same price. They project basically the same and Barrios is a little bit less popular. So in that sense, yeah, let's, let's just do that. Verlander, however, uh, what, 200 cheaper, so it's going to pop his value score a little bit higher. And naturally, we're seeing the ownership follow. So I don't really see anything wrong necessarily with Verlander so far. Um, I mean, this negative curveball value for a very good historical pitch for him is kind of jumping off the page, obviously, right? But we've only got 36 innings here. Like, guys seen 150 hitters, you know, so we can't take a hell of a lot out of this not throwing the curveball all that much just yet, or at least not enough to get you know, good value figures out of it. He's always given up a little bit of hard contact, right? Um, and the power numbers here in these couple of bad matchups, right, at Colorado, Tampa, uh, they are suggesting that, uh, you know, there's a little bit of short sample noise that we're still dealing with, right? So uh, I think that makes Verlander very playable. It's mostly the price tag and the strikeout matchup, right? Braves, just an average offense against right-handed pitching, even though they're going to hit for a lot of hard contact, good bit of power, they're not going to create a lot. We've talked about this a few times. That they don't have anybody stealing bases outside of Acuna. So they're dangerous to go after, but they're still striking out at an average clip, and they're not creating enough. So if we're looking for some regression for Verlander in a positive sense, right, he's probably not going to have a 4-0 ERA, the entire season. Um, if we're looking for positive variance, regression that is, then this is as fine a matchup to go after that because, once again, as we saw last night, uh, did Scherzer in a, in a high strikeout arm, historically high strikeout arm, right, still took them apart pretty good, even though they got to him a little bit. So I think Verlander's very much playable. And I love the price tag here. And I think he can outperform this median projection at a pretty decent clip. Certainly enough, um, you know, on a five-game slate, it, you know, he can outperform this one in four times or one in five times here, whatever his ownership is suggesting. So I think it's a very um, equitable play. But that doesn't mean you can't play Atlanta on the other side. Go ahead. This is a five-game slate, and this is probably the most potent offense. Um that would that you know that we've got access to here. So yeah, go ahead. If you if you want to play Verlander, he is still a fly ball pitcher, four seamer slider, curveball, right? Doesn't really have a swing and miss off speed pitch with the changeup. So that's going to make him a little bit susceptible to same handed hitters. I mean opposite handed hitters as well, but they've only got three lefties in the lineup, does Atlanta? So he'll give up a little bit of pop and some fly balls to the righties. And sure enough, 36% hard contact with a very noisy 1.8 homers per nine. But the four-seamer slider, if it's not excellent, you know, it can kind of hang him and bang him, so to speak, uh, with this with a hanging slider. And it can go a long way with a fly ball pitcher in Atlanta. So I think getting to some Atlanta pieces is fine. And getting to Verlander, I'd, I'd side with him. Uh, over Atlanta, and it certainly side with Strider. We already talked about him. Nothing wrong at all fundamentally there. Um, and I don't care that this is the Mets, and I don't care that they only strike out at 20% clip, 3% better than average. They also don't create. So Strider 
is just so far and away in every single metric the best strikeout pitcher in baseball that you can't really fade this it at any point uh, when he's under fourteen or fifteen thousand. I mean, it's just a stone lock. We already talked about that. The projection is just way too high. The ownership at the moment, way way too low. Uh, in in my opinion. So, yeah, let's get to a lot of Strider as well. Uh, if you want to play correlated stacks, correlated teams with Atlanta, you want to play both pitchers in this game. I think this is a playable construction. It's still not utilized a hell of a lot because we're still chasing pitcher wins and four points there on DK, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, realistically, that it doesn't affect DFS scoring all that much. It, it's non-zero, so there's that. But uh, it's kind of negligible in a lot of instances, right? When you've got two really good arms on the mound, um, either one of these guys can give up one run and still get a win out of a game. You know what I mean? So that's uh, it's perfectly fine. And Strider could strike out 12, not get a win. Verlander could strike out 8, go 7 innings, get the win. And both of them could still put a very serviceable DFS score. So uh, all is fine here. I, I want nothing to do with the Mets. However, this is a five-game slate. If you want to play um, you know, a piece here or there, uh, I mean, I guess, go ahead. It'd probably be like a Brandon Nimmo who doesn't strike out. Uh, I don't want to pay a regular price tag for Frankie Lindor uh, in this particular matchup. I don't want to play Jeff McNeil, even though he's a very low strikeout arm uh, or uh, strikeout bat against a very high strikeout arm. Um, so really not interested pretty much at all in the Mets. Uh, I'd rather just get to as much Strider as I can, and I'll probably end up just locking him in on every single team I build. So um, I like uh, pretty much all sides here outside of the Mets once again. Okay, let's get to the White Sox and the Yankees. We could probably get through this a little bit quicker. Uh, Clevenger on the mound for the White Sox. Um, they, they, they switched out for Lance Lynn. He's going to go in the first game against Luis Severino. It is going to be Vasquez in the in the second part of the doubleheader. So what we're going to have to keep an eye on here, uh, we don't have an ownership for him just yet because, like I said, we've got some shenanigans in the ownership models so far. Um, we got to keep an eye on where these figures come in. 6600 this is a pretty damn good price for Clev here. Um, and I think this is a playable piece if you want to get to a Strider and a Clevenger team. Like, this is attackable. He doesn't really strike anybody out, but this is starting to tick up a little bit, as a matter of fact. He was down at 17 18%. Uh, a lot of last year and early part of early earlier parts of this season um, starting to tick up a little bit and he's been okay right after he just came off with with a, a wrist or something um, in his last start he I believe was serviceable I don't have him up on the uh, other monitor here so I can't check his exact results but um, from memory uh, he was fine. And 6600 this is a good price for him, right? He's got upside at this particular price tag for 20 points. And on a five-game slate, if you're clicking into Strider, uh, you're, well, you're certainly going to need to save salary, right, to in order to get to a good offense. And what better way to do that with a guy that's got upside for 20 points, 15 and 20 points? You might only need that. Uh, who knows? I think this is perfectly fine, as is Vasquez on the other side. Um, at 4,000, we talked about this a little bit, but now you've got, you might be able to get Vasquez here in what's the same batted ball matchup as yesterday when he was popping for 20% ownership or something before the game got canceled. Uh, he's only going to get probably 10 today, as we saw with uh, Matt Dermody garnering a little bit at the same price tag. So, that said, he's got a very low medium projection here. I wouldn't go crazy with the 4K guys. I don't think we necessarily need to get all the way down there. You can get a little bit more balanced, even if you are clicking in to more expensive pitchers. Clevenger could be a way to to get us there a little bit. Um, leaving it on the table with the cutter and the four-seamer is Clev, but good breaking stuff so far in his 10 starts this year. 230 hitters starting to converge these numbers a little bit. Walk rate's concerning at a full 10%, it's mostly to the lefties, so he's giving up power there, and he's got some control issues. So if we're going to go after Clev a little bit, I'd like to do it with uh, a couple of these lefties, right? Anthony Rizzo, 4500 at Yankee Stadium, sign me up. That's a very playable price tag for him. Willie Calhoun, stone minimum, very playable price tag. Jake Bowers, 2300 as well. 
Now, they're going to go right-handed heavy, which is why I think Clevenger is in play here, similar to Jose Barrios, right, against Houston. His arsenal here is going to play pretty well against right-handers, right? His fastball is not super equitable for him, but it's not terrible, right? It's only given up and out to the field, and, yeah, that's that's okay. I mean, it's not horrific, right? It's not a, an out and a half that he's given up on the cutter, right? Um, so the cutter, not a very good pitch here. He's kind of mixing this in, trying to get it to work to suppress some of the production against lefties, not working just yet. Should just rely more so on on the changeup to neutralize a lot of lefty power. But he's throwing a lot of stuff. He's got five pitches that he mixes in and that makes him serviceable in the what's overall the plus side of the platoon here against him. So if I were going to take some Yankee pieces, um, yeah, you you play the home run hitters. Play Josh Donaldson. He's fine, 3,100. Because overall, Clevenger's still not going to strike him out a hell of a lot, right? He does have a an above-average strikeout rate to the right side of the plate. Um, but that's still an attackable figure with a Stanton, with a Donaldson, with a Glaber Torres. Um, if I were going to play a righty, it probably... My favorite would probably be Glaber, because he didn't strike out nearly as much as Stanton or Donaldson. But Stanton and Donaldson are both fine. Price adjusted for Donaldson at 3100 Stanton, because he's Stanton, it's a fine price there at 4800 And he's got a lot of power. So, yeah, sure, go ahead. If you want to stack the Yankees, I think this is okay. Going after an aggregate 20% K rate guy with some walk susceptibility in him. I think that's fine. My favorite plays, I think, are going to be probably just shorter pieces of the Yankees. Um, maybe a Stanton, Willie Calhoun, Jake Bowers types. And, and going after the susceptibility to the left side of the plate when he's got the attackable four-seamer and a far less equitable cutter uh, that he's going to bat with. So um, I do like some Yankees here, and we can stack some White Sox as well. You can still go after a young arm, even though you can play Vasquez on the mound. This low-median projection t should tell us something. If he's only going to pop in a median from a median standpoint at 8, 10 points... That means the other the other offense is pretty likely to put up put up some uh, some scoring against him, right? So we can get to them, even though they are dreadful, pretty much against everybody. 141 ISO, 28, 29 percent hard contact. They're not going to strike out, but it, this is average, right? 82 WRC plus because they don't get on base, they don't create, right? 289 WOBA with a buck 32 ground ball to fly ball. These are not good numbers, right? Pretty underperforming offense overall. So that puts Vasquez in play, but it also puts the White Sox in play because Vasquez is not, as of yet, a fully developed major league arm. All right, so he's certainly attackable with White Sox, and this is a five-game slate. Uh, okay, let's get to the last game here. I've been yapping quite a bit about a bunch of nonsense. Five games, I still find a way to talk for an hour. Uh, Drew Smiley, 7,000 is a playable price tag for him. Um, I do not really like the projection here. I think he's a kind of a dangerous spot for him i've been looking to short drew smiley for a long time um going on what a month now and it hasn't really worked all that well for me just yet uh, i think we might be able to get to some angels here tonight um his last couple outings have not been great he got picked apart by cincinnati in four and two thirds struck out just two gave up five earned and sprayed seven hits in his last outing against san diego another bad matchup for a, a lefty with just two pitches two and a half pitches um, five and two-thirds struck out just four, gave up three earned, walked three batters, right? So the walks are starting to surface a little bit in his, in his last three outings, really, two, two, and three walks. So I think that makes uh, Smiley attackable. However, he's 7,000. This is an attractive price tag, right? We are getting him not quite at seasonal lows. He was at 6,900 in one of his earlier starts in the season, but he was all the way up to 9,100. So we're getting a pretty nice discount relative to recent price tags. I mean, that was five starts ago. He's been in the mid-7Ks since then. But um, I think this is an attackable price for him to go after what's... I mean, can be a, a pretty um, difficult lineup to attack sometimes. However, the Angels here against lefties far, far better than they are against righties. 120 WRC+. plus. You see that in aggregate, right, 500 PA sample that is included in these... Um, these numbers here, their numbers against righties are dragging the 120 WRC plus that they display against lefties all the way down to an aggregate 110, right? So 
far worse against um, against right-handers, or far more average, I should say, than they are against lefties. 22% about a click or so better than average. 33% hard with some power, mostly coming from Trout and Otani. But Taylor Ward has been pretty good recently. He's still at a very playable 3,400. Go ahead and play Otani, lefty-lefty. Drew Smiley has historically given up a good bit of hard contact to left-handers and some pop to them. And sure enough, even in this short sample here, still a 220 ISO with 34% hard contact to the left side of the plate. A lot of fly balls, though, from the righties here. And what really kind of would put me on to him, instead of just clicking into the Angels uh, as the most popular team tonight, is the soft contact here. 25% soft contact versus 24% hard contact allowed to the right side of the plate. Total inversion there, and that's fantastic. And it's really persisted. Um, heavy, heavy fly ball, so it makes him kind of difficult to stack against with a ton of righties. And that's really not super excellent for Trout necessarily, because Trout's a fly ball hitter, right? Um, Anthony Rendon, he'll hit some more ground balls. He's at a very playable 3,300. Brandon Drury, a bit more neutral ground ball to fly ball against lefties, matches up a little bit better than does Trout, even though Trout still has a, what, 320 ISO against left-handed pitching. I mean, you're not fading Trout just because it's a bad, you know, uh, ground ball to fly ball matchup necessarily. But, uh, you know, it's, it's notable, right? And the soft contact to hard contact ratio here is notable. So that would put me on in addition to the price tag, a little bit of Drew Smiley. And there's another way that we can get contrary in here. Nobody's playing Drew Smiley. And he certainly has six inning, seven inning upside, even in a bad matchup. I still want to side with the Angels most often and go after Smiley. Um, but I do like the price tag here and would not be surprised if he survives for six innings and strikes out five and doesn't give up anything. Um, is sort of on the plus side of the variance here. Ye or the uh, Angels are going to stack some righties against him tonight. I'm not going to leave out Otani or anything crazy like that. But, um, you know, they brought up uh, Joe Adele, for example. And they're probably going to put, what, seven, eight righties in the lineup again tonight. So there's there are routes here for, of course, the Angels to get there. But for Smiley to get there at this particular price tag as well. He has 20 in the tank at this price tag, and I think that's a playable piece. Uh, Reed Detmer's on the other side, 6,500, same deal for him. He's, however, going to be 30% owned. So if I were to choose between the two in tournaments, I'd probably just click in Drew Smiley. Um, Reed Detmer's has been super hard for me to figure out, too. Uh, I don't know how, with a bad changeup and a bad four-seamer, or a break-even four-seamer, he has such high whiff stuff to the right side of the play. He's got a 28% K rate to righties when he's got a neutral curveball, a, cur a changeup that he doesn't throw all that often, and it gets tattooed, and a break-even four-seamer. Really not understanding how this happens. So I've been shorting, like, Reed Detmers for, like, going on a year and a half, and he's made me look pretty stupid <laughs> as well. Um, but 6500 this makes him a very playable price tag. High medium projection here. Cubs have been dreadful over the last two weeks, three weeks, really. Even though their aggregate number is still very high, 115 WRC+, plus, they're striking out a lot more. 25%, that's two ticks above average here. 33% hard, yeah. 175 ISO, that, that's all there still. Neutral ground ball to fly ball. Still very dangerous. It's in there in the aggregate numbers. They're walking at a 9% clip, right? So I think there's opportunity for the Cubs here to get on base and go after some Reed Detmers because... I'm not impressed with this arsenal, right? And we've talked a couple of times about break-even pitches relative to league average yielding more variance when they are not at their best, right? They can be good pitches, of course, but they can also be really, really bad. And if any one of these is bad, it's pretty likely that the others are also to be bad, right? So um, that makes him very attackable, and I don't like eating when guys are not Spencer Strider, uh, a lot of super chalky SP2 ownership. Because now you, all of a sudden, you're eating 70% on Strider, you're eating 30% on the Angels, and you're kind of pigeonholed into a particular construction. So 
how are we going to get different with that? Well, you're going to have to make some gulpy decisions in the batter's box, and that kind of stinks, right? So I think I'd rather pivot off of Reed Detmers. I'm, I mean, I'd certainly rather do that than pivot off of Spencer Strider, right? That's a far There's far less opportunity cost down here, even though Detmers is a hell of a lot cheaper. Um, like, he needs to really get there. He, You can get to 20, 25 points with one of the other starting pitchers on the mound, um, for far less half the ownership. So you don't have to eat this and you can try and get different elsewhere, right? The arsenals for the other guys and the matchups for the other guys are better than Reed Detmers here. It's just really just a price tag that's popping him so far. So I'm not overly impressed, even though the, the strikeout stuff to the right side is really good. He's still giving up 40% hard contact with an 080 ground ball to fly ball and a 29% line drive rate. I'm going to attack that every single time. So I like getting to Cubs leverage stacks here against Reed Detmers and very high ownership. Uh, we'll have to keep an eye on where these numbers flesh out by the end of the day, of course. Um, but I hope that uh, gives everybody an idea as to how I think about lineup construction on shorter slates like this and... Um, and opportunity cost when we've got such a large projection and really an ownership delta as well to everybody else on the slate. He's, he's far and away the best play here today is Strider. Um, so I'm, I'll just tell you what I'm doing. I'm going to be locking him in, and I think that's, you know, <laughs> we'll figure the rest out later kind of deal. So, uh, not, I mean, you play pretty much everybody's five-game slate. You can play everybody on the mound. I think everybody is really playable. Um, either due to price tag or matchup or some combination of the two. Uh, I do have Severino and Lance Lynn up here. That's not uh, who it's going to be. Obviously, that's pulling into the data from the first game. Uh, so ignore that. But I think offensive pieces are playable in this game. Um, offensive pieces playable in this game. I'm mostly off of it because I'm clicking in a lot of Strider, and I like Verlander a really good bit too. Um so I think my off-the-board stack here would probably be the Cubs if I had to choose, as opposed to the Angels, and maybe some Drew Smiley here. Um, but I like Framber. I like Berrios. You know, Dermody's fine because he's 4,000, as is Randy Vasquez. Um, Mike Clevenger, right? He's playable at 6,600 also. So literally everybody, I think, is in play here today. So that makes for some really interesting tournament stuff. Um, and then you throw the, the Strider projection ownership dynamic on top of that. I think that's a really, really cool way to analyze the slate. So that said, uh, that's what we've got here for today, guys. Keep an eye out for the updates. Of course, we will have numbers pushed to the site. We'll see where Clevenger and Vasquez come in. Um, so make sure to monitor this stuff and see if you can uh, really make some good decisions on the mound. If you want to fade Strider, I mean, be my guest, but uh, I'm certainly not doing it. So good luck to everybody here on uh, Thursday's main.